Good morning. Greetings to all who are watching this video. I thought it was, port it was important since I use the King James Bible and I don't use any other version. I just wanted to have some kind of record as to, as to why I do that. It is a rather deep subject, or just meaning the history of the Bible is a deep subject. And so I have a link. Hopefully we have a link in the description at the bottom that which will take you to uh, a blog that I have done on our blog site, The Remaining Remnant from blogspot.com. Uh, that will explain in greater detail the views of this because Satan likes to confuse the issue. I think up front it's a very simple issue. And I really hope that by the Holy Spirit it will be witness to you what the words of God are and what they aren't. I think it's very important that we have a standard of God's word. Of course, today we have hundreds of Bible versions, and this could really confuse people, but maybe the, the greater danger is people saying, I, I like this the way it sounds. I like it the way it sounds. It's good for me. You know, there's a problem with that. A lot of things can sound good that really aren't good. And uh, so I just think it's important to have the standard. One of the things that you will be influenced on greatly, it is generally just broadcast that uh, all of the Bibles are saying the same thing. They say, don't make a big deal about the Bible version issue. They're all saying the same thing. It's just slightly different ways. Oh, if you like the King James, that's your preference. You know, oh, you're old-fashioned or this or that. Uh, thankfully today, as far as I know, the King James Bible is still very widely used. And uh, at least by one tally I saw, they are still above half of all the Bibles used. But if the Bibles are saying the same thing, then they should be easy to compare. When the Bible Revision Committee met from 1871 to 1881, they had put a lot of pressure on the existing organized church to bring forth a revision of the King James because that had been the standard for 260 years. It had gone all around the world. The only protest they used was that they said, well, we need to update the language. We don't speak like this anymore. It's hard for people to understand. And so that sounds like a very noble purpose, but it should be easy enough to see if that's actually what happened or if it didn't happen. You know, today we have taken God's word far too lightly. And it is literally being retranslated by pastors every Sunday all around the world. I'm not saying every pastor. I'm just saying a lot of, a lot of pastors, probably hundreds if not thousands of times. And uh, it should be leaning on God's word. It's already been translated. It's difficult enough with the truth before you rather than changing the words or trying to find something you like to read to the congregation. God had a standard. So I just wanted to cite a few examples, first of all, so that you would see what we're talking about. Uh, for my own, for my own uh, comparison, uh, obviously I did not want to invest a lot in other Bible versions. I had used the New American Standard Version for about 17 years before I went back to the King James after having studied the issue and such. But the one I use today is today's New International Version, that was uh, copyrighted, I believe I saw it was 2001, and the NIV itself was very popular. Uh, as far as I know, it is the most popular of the Bible revisions. And so I want to compare a few verses with the King James, so you can see these are differences not only in word, but in doctrine. Uh, and small word changes can, be, can bring great changes in meaning. So please listen carefully. In Isaiah 14, 12, I'll read first from the King James. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? This is the first half of the verse. There's actually another half, but that's the important half. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? This is the only verse in Scripture that tells us Satan's pre-fallen name, the name when he was an angel, the anointed chair of the covers. His name was Lucifer. It's not found anywhere else in Scripture. But listen to what the TNIV does. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. The TNIV changes Lucifer to morning star. Jesus is the morning star. Read Revelation 22.16. In either version, 
It says the same thing, Jesus is the morning star, and the TNIV is indicating that Jesus has fallen from heaven. Isn't that what it's saying? That's what this simple change is. They just drop Lucifer altogether, and they substitute morning star. The next one I'll use is a little lighter, let's say. Some might find it even humorous. I wish I could. Uh, it's from Proverbs 16.31. The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. Now, the hoary head is simply gray hair. It is talking about, typically, an older person. But the hoary head is a crown of glory, if it is found in the way of righteousness. There's nothing wrong with that scripture. It's fine. However, in the TNIV, they wanted to change hoary head to gray hair. There's nothing wrong with that either, in my opinion. But it says this, Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Or actually, I think I had read, I think I read it in the, the NIV first. You see, the TNIV is supposed to be a revision of the NIV. And I think I had seen it in the NIV when I had my mother's old Bible. I think it said it is attained, gray hair is attained by a righteous life. Everybody knows you don't get gray hair from a righteous life. Everybody knows that. It's just a blatant lie. And this does a lot of damage to the credibility of the Bible and the credibility of Proverbs when you read something like this. But of course, it can bring a lot of comfort to some evil people with gray hair. Now I'm going to read from Titus 3.10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. A heretic after you have admonished him once and twice and reject him. That would be someone trying to bring in false doctrines to the church. Say like we find in 1 Corinthians 5 when a man is actually having his, his father's wife. He's committing fornication with her and they are being rebuked through Paul for this. If he were trying to espouse this as something legitimate in God's eyes, he would be bringing in heresy. That's an example. So Titus 3.10 is refuting heretics. Listen to what the TNIV does. It says, Warn divisive people once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. So now we have changed it from a heretic to someone who is divisive. A heretic is divisive, but you don't have to be a heretic to be divisive. And as a matter of fact, in Luke 12, 51, Jesus said he came to bring division. So here again, the TNIV is talking against Jesus. All right. It is promoting unity. Unity is what the Antichrist wants and needs for the world system that he's going to rule. So changing heretic to a divisive person is a very, it's a very big doctrinal change, okay? So let us go now to, uh, this is my last example from Genesis 22, 8. This is where God had called Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And in the verse preceding this, Isaac was asking his father, where is the sacrifice? We have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the animal? You know, what's going on? And this is Abraham's reply. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Do you hear that? God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. This is a prophecy of Jesus coming to die for the sins of the world. It is terrific. We rejoice in that as Christians. Listen to what the TNIV does with just a small change of words. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Wow. The TNIV just takes that prophecy away, and we no longer have it. So I just hope you see by these examples, this is something serious. This isn't something picky. I'm not condemning anyone if they're using another version. Okay? You may remember in the book of Acts, uh, uh, who was that? Aquila and Priscilla. I believe it was, they were listening to Apollos, who had only been a believer through, uh, through the teaching of John the Baptist. It says he was eloquent in speech. He was mighty in scriptures. It said they, they heard him, and then they led him in the way of God more perfectly. And that's exactly, in my opinion, what is needed 
if you're using another version, let's try to get to the Word of God more perfectly. Now, like I said, if, if, uh, if you don't want to do that, if you're not convicted to do that, please just keep it in prayer and try to do comparisons along the way. From the time it was exposed to me about the King James Bible, and this came through uh, Chick Publications. It's www.chick.com. They have a lot of good resources on, on the Bible version issue. And the track they put out is called The Attack. Just a little track. It is loaded with information on the history of the Bible. And in that, in that book, at the end it said, if your Bible is missing this verse, it's been tampered with. And it was 1 John 5, 7. It is one that supports the Trinity. And I looked in my Bible, the New American Standard, and it was gone. And so I began a, a, a search. I wasn't ready to throw away my Bible. But as I began comparing the two after about three years, I finally went back to the King James. Uh, just giving you a little bit of a history of the translation technique. The King James translators... Uh, it began with 54 translators in 1604. They ended with 47 in 1611. They lost seven through death. Okay, I'm not sure that all of those deaths were natural either. Okay, but each of these translators was well able to translate the entire Bible for themselves from the original languages. Okay, but by virtue of their translation technique, they had to be in agreement on every word at least 14 times. So, in other words, no one was getting their own private view into this, like we see today, or like was encouraged in, in the revision that took place 260 years later. There is nothing, uh, there is no version that equals the King James. I have to check myself because I, I've just gained such strength from faith in the Word of God, knowing it is His Word. I would encourage you in this. Uh, the manuscripts behind the King James were 5,322, a huge amount of manuscripts, and they were in overwhelming agreement with each other. Uh, the revision manuscripts were 44, and they were in a great deal of disharmony from each other. Very few people have seen the revision manuscripts. Some of them were very old, but they were not in very good shape. They had words crossed out, other words written on top of words. And so you can really trust the manuscripts that underlie the King James Bible and the translators for the technique that they used. And they did this under the authority of a king. The king got them together to make this one version. They had about uh, six or seven English versions. It was all kind of leading up and perfecting to this time to make one version for God's word. And this is the word then that went around the world uh, when the missionaries went out. This is what they use to evangelize uh, around the world. So I just urge you not to be fooled by scholarly arguments. Look at the evidence for yourself and uh, pray for it. Uh, I want people to know because the time is here and it's going to be much more urgently upon us that we know what the Word of God says. A lot of things have been changed to mislead and it's a deliberate effort. I'm not saying that the people who printed the Bibles absolutely know that, but obviously the devil is behind it. He does not want us to be ready for what he has in store for this world. He wants us to fall and take the mark of the beast. I do love you. I hope and pray that you will take this to heart. God bless.